All right, we are in Matthew chapter 11. Uh, we had uh, left off about verse 15 or 16. Jesus is talking about John the baptizer. Uh, John was in prison. He sent some delegates to Jesus to uh, ask about the identity of Jesus, if he's the one they've been expecting, or should they look for someone else. And Jesus talks about the evidence of his ministry, the things that were going on, the things that were evident about his miracles and, and things of that sort, the blind seeing, the lame walking, and so on, the poor having the gospel preached to them. And, and uh, so go tell John that and it would uh, help validate for him Jesus is the one. It was hard for John being where he was in prison. He would soon be beheaded, and, um, and so he's anxious about some things, and uh, maybe hoping Jesus would take some action, maybe even that would prevent that, who knows. But uh, Jesus sends John's uh, uh, delegates back to John, and then he turns to the crowd and he starts talking about John. Who'd you go out to see? Did you think he was a reed shaking in the wind? Did you think he'd be wearing fancy clothes like they do in the king's palace or something of that? That's not John. And he was a prophet and he was more than a prophet. And Jesus begins to talk about John and how wonderful he was and the role that he filled. And, um, and about verse 14, if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. So he's fulfilling that Old Testament prophecy from Malachi. And he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. Not literally Elijah, but the spirit and power of Elijah. With Malachi is the closing of God's prophetic work through men for several hundred years, 400 years. With John coming on the scene, all of a sudden God is talking again through a prophet. And so there is something wonderful happening. People are noticing that. They're flooding out to John to hear his preaching. And he's preaching about repent, repentance. And he's preparing the hearts of men for the ministry of Jesus. And, uh, and this is where we're at in our text now. And verse 16 through 19 but to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in a marketplace. And they call out to the other children and say, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So Jesus said, here's what this generation is like. The ones who are rejecting the baptism of John. The ones who are so hard to convince. The ones who wouldn't believe in what Jesus was saying. Here's what they're like. You just can't make them happy. First they want this and then they want that. Nothing. They're like these children in the marketplace. You didn't dance when we said dance. You didn't, you didn't mourn when we said to mourn. And uh, you can't ever make them happy, and uh, they're, they're just never going to get along. And, um, and so that's what he likens his generation to. I would like to compare Luke's account of that. So if you keep your, your finger or a marker in Matthew 11, and go over to Luke's account. This is Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And if you're in that chapter, you're going to be looking down at verse 29 and following from there. <clears throat> when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves not having been baptized by John. To what then shall I compare the men of this generation, and what are they like? Well, you get a little fuller reading in Luke's account. There were, there were the tax collectors, there were people of that kind, they readily accepted the preaching of John. They were baptized by, by John's baptism. They accepted that. But it was the Pharisees and the lawyers who rejected that. And that's what this 
little illustration is about. What are the men of this generation like? Well, they're like children who sit in the marketplace who call to one another and say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, you did not weep. He's talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about the lawyers. That's who he's talking about. Not about the tax collectors and sinners who accepted John's preaching. Verse 33, For John the Baptist has come eating no bread, drinking no wine. You say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom. And there's a little slight change in verse 35 here from the account in Matthew. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. So back to verse 29, when the people, the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice. This is the wisdom he's talking about in Luke 7, 35. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. These are the ones who are aligning with the teaching of God. They are aligning themselves with the purpose of God. They're listening to John's preaching. They're accepting it as from heaven. They're being baptized by John's baptism. And this is the wisdom, the justice of God. That is bearing fruit, and that's becoming more and more evident as time goes on. But then there's those Pharisees and, uh, and, and the lawyers, and they're rejecting all of this. And they're like these stubborn children in the marketplace. Now that's where we left off last week. We're going to pick up now. He's going to keep talking about some cities. He's up around Lake Galilee. And there's three cities up there that he's going to be talking about. He did the majority of his miracles there. And he talks about how they're impenitent. They won't repent. They won't listen. They won't change. And he begins to talk about them. And he's going to compare them to three cities in Old Testament history. Now you've read ahead. We're in verses 20 through 24 in Matthew 11. You've read ahead there a little bit. We've been in this chapter long enough. You've read this chapter. Who are the three cities? What three cities does Jesus talk about around that area of Galilee? What's one of them? Chorazin, another one. Bethsaida, last one. Capernaum. And he, then he compares them to some things in the Old Testament. What's one of those Old Testament cities? Who? Tyre? And Sidon and Sodom. So those are the three Old Testament history comparisons. And I put some information in your handout where you can read about Tyre and Sidon. We're more familiar with Sodom and Gomorrah. We know about that where Lot lived with his family and the things that were happening there. We're more familiar with Sodom, maybe not as much with Tyre and Sidon, but if you run down those Old Testament references in your handout, you can read about those cities. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You'll descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Don't ask me how it's more tolerable in the day of judgment. All these cities were condemned. And I don't know what it means to be more tolerable in the day of judgment other than this idea. And this is the prevalent idea in this paragraph. This is what it's pointing out. These 
cities, these New Testament cities up around Lake Galilee, they receive more information, more proof about God's will and God's purpose in Christ, and history had unfolded more, so they had greater evidence, therefore they had greater responsibility and greater accountability. They had greater privilege, and so they were more accountable in that way. And that's about as much as I can explain about it being more tolerable for one than the other. They had more evidence. They had more proof. They had greater accountability. Their condemnation is more sure. And so he compares these cities in this way. <clears throat> One thing that I would point out is an application. And every once in a while I pause in this study and talk about something I think we ought to be able to learn from it that as Jesus is talking about Chorazin, or he's talking about Bethsaida, or he's talking about Capernaum, and he had traveled there. This is the Son of God. And he's doing a majority of his miracles there. And the evidence is overwhelming. And they had greater evidence than those three cities in the Old Testament. Sometimes people will say something like this. Boy, if I had, if I'd just been there in the first century, if I'd just been there when Jesus walked the earth and saw those miracles, my faith would be so much stronger as if there was so much more evidence. Is that true? From where we stand today, from our vantage point, is that true? Who has more evidence? Did they in the first century world in those three cities Jesus is talking about, did they have more evidence than we do? Or do we have more evidence than they did? Here's the idea. If they had this, if they had the full picture, and that's really what we have. We have the full picture of the scheme of redemption. Everything from Genesis to the book of Revelation. All of it laid out, a glimpse of heaven beyond, how we're supposed to get there, the role of Jesus, who he is, validated through the resurrection, which they did not have yet. If they had the evidence that we have today, they would have repented back then. That's the same kind of logic Jesus is using with three, these three cities, comparing them to those Old Testament cities. We have more evidence. We have history unfolded. We have the establishment of the Lord's church. We have the first gospel sermon and those that followed after. We see people converted to Christ. We understand the sacrifice, the blood of Christ, how to apply it to our soul, what God has in mind for our life and eternity. We have greater evidence than they did. Therefore, we have greater responsibility and accountability. And we have been given the Great Commission. And so you think about it that way. And really, people are wrong when they suggest that, boy, if I'd been back there, that just would have been so much more evidence, so much more proof. Well, we have all of that, and we have this. And so our accountability is even greater. We understand more than they did. And so we have this great responsibility to our Lord. Something else that I would mention here, and this would be a reasoning, a logic, to use if you are studying the Bible with someone. <clears throat> and they may never tell you this. They may never own up to it. They may never reveal it. But so often you'll study with someone and in the process of presenting the gospel, you will get to how one obeys the gospel. <coughs> And it is so different from 
what denominationalism teaches around us. They don't understand baptism the same way, obedience to the gospel, how to accomplish that to be pleasing in the favor of God. And you might get around to that and they will stumble at it. They will hesitate. And sometimes what's going on is their religious background. Maybe they come from a denominational religion where they sprinkled water on people or didn't baptize at all or poured water on the head of a baby or baptized so that one could be a member of that local church but not for the remission of sins. And in their background, what they're mulling over, what they're thinking is, I've got my grandparents, I've got my parents, I've got my, my spouse who is deceased, I've got a son or a daughter, or I've got these family members, and they all believed like I used to believe about that. They all believed that way. They all lived and they died in that faith in that faulty religion. They lived and died there. And for me to admit now that that was wrong, I would be saying they're lost. And they've already passed on. And I would have to admit they're lost. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd be saying they didn't make it. If I, were to, if I were to obey the gospel the way I'm seeing here, if I were to, I'd be admitting that they didn't do that. And so where would they be? And they can't bring themselves to, they stumble at that point. They can't bring themselves to do it. And you may, you may never hear that from their lips, but it's going through the gears of their mind and their emotions. And so I would think about this text or a text similar to it. And the reasoning that's here. Your loved one who passed on in that former belief, Old Testament cities, Tyre, Sidon, Sodom. Look what happened to them, the judgment of God against them. But the reasoning of Jesus is, if they had been given the evidence that you, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, if they'd been given the evidence that you've just been given, they would have repented. They would have accepted it. So the reasoning would be, this loved one that you're concerned about, are you, are you thinking about your mom and dad? Are you thinking about your grandparents? Are you thinking about your deceased husband or wife? Are you thinking about them? Let me ask you something. Were they honest hearted people were they sincere and honest hearted people if they had been given the evidence they didn't have it they didn't learn it they didn't know about it but if they'd been given the evidence in the bible that you've just been given what would they have done with it would they have obeyed it or would they have turned the page in God's book and closed it? What would they have done? Were they sincere and honest-hearted people? And if they would have been given the evidence you've just been given, would they have done it? What do you think? And that kind of logic, that's the kind of logic Jesus is using here, that may help them to get over that stumbling point. Well, would this be saying that this loved one of mine, that they're lost and they're not going to go to heaven? I don't know. That's not my job. It is not my job to judge anybody. I'm not in the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to take care of that. That's not my place. That's not my role. I'm making no comment about, about your relative, whoever. I'm not making any comment whatsoever about them. I don't know. But my job is to teach the truth. And here we are learning truth together. What are you going to do with it? God's going to take care of them. That's his role. He'll do that. Do you believe God's just? Okay, we'll leave that with God.
but right now here we are and you've just learned this. What are you going to do with it? That may help them pass that stumbling place. And they may never bring that up. But when you begin to study with someone, you should already be asking them, what is your religious background? And learn about that. Think about the implications of that. Were you brought up that way? Mom and dad take you to church here at this place? And start to learn about that background because that's going to come into play. That's going to be their, their, their background of what their thinking and processing as they go through a study of the gospel. And once you know that, you may be able to volunteer some things that will help them over some hurdles. <clears throat> so this is, this is a very strong logic. And Jesus is trying to persuade these Pharisees and lawyers and people like them to rethink their position. And some of them did. Many of them did not. Your questions or comments here? Yep. Right. Max, Max uh, uh, reiterates this idea that if we're in a study process with, process with somebody, stay out of the judgment seat of God. Give him that role. That's what he claims for himself. Stay out of the judgment seat of God, the final day, who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. Preach the truth. Teach the truth. Let that, let that land where it will. That's our responsibility and, and when people try to put you in the hot seat and, you know, so what are you saying about my loved ones? What are you saying about my family? What do you, stay out of that seat. That belongs to God. Let's just teach the truth and, and they'll be able to make applications from that and hopefully get beyond that difficulty and, uh, and for themselves at the moment do the right thing. That's what, that's what our effort is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Curtis brings up a funeral service. And and sometimes you will uh, attend a funeral service and um, you know that someone has not obeyed the gospel and um, I've never been to a funeral service where somebody didn't go to heaven uh, that's, that's the way everybody thinks of it and we think that way of our brothers and sisters in Christ and we think that way from 1 Thessalonians 4 13 through 18 uh, not, not to be uh, unaware of those who sleep in Jesus and the promise for the faithful there about how that when the Lord comes back, they're going to rise first. And, and then we'll go with them and meet the Lord in the air. And, there's, and comfort each other with these words. We're told to comfort each other with these words. But we're talking about those that we know of as brothers and sisters in Christ. They've obeyed the same gospel we've obeyed. But it's difficult when you're in a funeral setting and you know that, that that's not the truth. That's not what has happened. And... Um, and so, yeah, that's a real tough time. That's a, it is. It's a very difficult time. And um, uh, some funerals that I do, um, I, you know, I try to make them about the life of the person and leave it there. Just, let's just remember the life of the person, but not talk about their soul salvation or because that's not appropriate. And um, I, the, the most trouble I ever got in at a funeral, the most trouble I ever got in was a fellow who just 
he was pouting with his wife and they had a disagreement they didn't get along he wanted to he wanted to sell a house they were up in years they were in their retirement years he wanted he wanted to sell the house and go move into a trailer out in the country and she didn't want to she wanted to stray, stay in the brick and mortar house that they had paid for around town where all the doctors were and the stores and everything else they needed she wouldn't agree with him she wouldn't sign the papers and he ended his life over it so here's my phone ringing and i've got to do this funeral and i'm looking out at the audience in the funeral and there's grandchildren and there's you know nieces and nephews and families and kids and and they're all, i mean they're all out here and my my plea was that there are better ways to handle difficulties of life this was not a good choice a good fella in a lot of ways and we like all these things you know that that we shared with him but this is not a good choice and there's better ways to handle our problems and difficulties in life and so this is not an option this is not pleasing to god boy i got in trouble i but that, but that's it's, it's it's not a game it's not a game and um and i've i I've never intended to be a preacher who will just say what is expected of me, but to say what needs to be said. And boy, I got in trouble over that. And um, okay, and and um, that that was just that was that, you know. And um, I I don't know that I ever saw his widow in church again but uh, I felt like that something needed to be said for all these young ears who knew what happened and they're going to all face difficulties in life and problems and hardships and it's going to be a struggle sometimes now I, I didn't want them to think that was an option and that you could you could take a shortcut to heaven that way you can't it doesn't work that way boy I got in trouble for that um, but um, it's, it's, you know, I, I don't know that I, I've never been to a funeral where somebody didn't go to heaven, no matter how they lived or who they were. And it's not the truth. That's not the way the Bible presents it. Okay, we've talked about that enough, and, uh, and we'll move on here. And let's look, at, uh, let's look at our next text in verses 25 through 30. <clears throat> verses 25 and 26 first. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Who are the infants? Who are, who are the wise and intelligent? And who are the infants? Who was accepting the teaching of John? Who was accepting the teaching of Jesus? Who was doing that? Tax collectors, sinners, people of that nature, those who are like infants, like, how are children, how are infants? What are they like? They watch, they imitate, they learn. They're sponges, they're ready, they're humble. When you get to chapter 18 and chapter 19, Jesus brings up children there. Suffer the children to come unto me, of such is the kingdom of heaven. Unless you humble yourself as this little child, these are the ones he's revealing it to, the infants, these people who are of the class among the Jews that were outcasts because of the sins they've committed. Tax collectors, sinners, harlots, people of that nature. <coughs> and they're like the infants. But you have those who are wise in their own estimation, Pharisees, lawyers, people of that kind. And so that's how he's portraying them now. And, and so um, down in verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. If you make any notations in your Bible, if you'll go up to verse 25 and circle the word infants, 
Come down to verse 27. Anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him and draw an arrow from that line in verse 27 up to the word infants in verse 25, they connect that way. He wills to reveal Him to those who will come to Him as infants, as those who are humble, as those who are ready to learn, ready to soak up the teaching, ready to follow and obey. That's who He's talking about in verse 27. Jesus here has a unique relationship with the Father and the Father with the Son. In John 1.18, Jesus came to earth and He has explained Him. In the life of Christ, in the incarnation, as He comes in flesh and He lives among men, He has explained, He has exegeted the Father to the world in that process. He has that kind of a relationship. In Hebrews 1 and verse 2, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son. Nobody knows the Father except the Son. Nobody knows the Son except the Father. A very unique relationship, and there is information. There is wisdom. There is knowledge that is only divine and can only come to us through the source of God. You may be able to figure out how a wheel is round and it rolls better than something that's square. But there's a, there's a unique wisdom that is only from God that has to do with sin and forgiveness and heaven is our reward, how we get there, how we approach God in a pleasing way. And Jesus has explained Him. And He speaks to us through His Son. And that has come down to us in, through, the, through time in Scripture. This is the revelation of the mind of God. Every time you open this book, you are looking at the mind of God revealed to mankind in what He desires of us. It is your guidepost through life. And Jesus is the only source of that. If you do not believe Him, who He is, and the authority given to Him, you're not going to find out. You're not going to get it. So all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Very similar to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. About what? About the scheme of redemption. About bringing mankind back to relationship with the Father above. All this authority, this, this culminating, implementing of salvation's plan... That has been put in the power of Christ. And He's willing to reveal that. And only those who come to Him like the infants, like children, in that kind of humility, are going to be able to get it. The others are going to be stubborn and refusing like those children in the marketplace. Then comes this great invitation, and we are down to uh, the last few verses here, 28, 29, and 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Who's weary and heavy laden? Why are they weary and heavy laden? What's that about? Sin. The weight of sin, carrying that around, trying to get rid of that myself, trying to overcome it myself, trying to carry that load and that burden around and do something with it to get it off my back, off my conscience, off my record. To do that, and remember he's talking to the Jews. They're trying to accomplish this through the law of Moses through crossing the T's and dotting the I's and doing everything exactly right and making no mistakes. And, and they're weary and they're heavy laden and the burden's still with them. They've never been forgiven of their sins. The blood of bulls and goats cannot forgive sin, Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. It's a reminder of sin every year. 
And, and so he tells them, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I've written on your handout just the words. And I, I, I just highlighted those words for you off to the right margin on the back page. So you could think about those individual words in this great invitation. Come. Come to me. Come is an encouragement, and it implies something. You can come. There is ability, and I have provided opportunity. Come all. Come all who are weary and heavy. All goes even beyond the Jewish nation. It's universal in its scope, and that became evident as the gospel is preached, beginning in Acts chapter 2 and beyond. The weary and heavy laden, they're recognizing their sinfulness. They recognize the need. They have the heaviness of that on them. And they're looking for an escape from it. And then look at the pronouns. Come to me. I will give you rest. My yoke. Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus is the only source. He is the only hope. I will give you rest. It is the Savior's willingness to help mankind. I will give you rest is the result of the forgiveness. It is the relief. It is the refreshing, the reviving of the Spirit. We sing that song from time to time, Restore my soul. You can have rest. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is a responsibility. It governs. It turns you a certain way. It gives you direction. A yoke is responsibility of those who are seeking forgiveness. Learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. That is the burden of that yoke. It involves teaching and learning and changing in application of what you learn. I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart. This is our kind and caring master. It is an easy yoke. It is bearable it is doable. It is in contrast with that heavy load of sin. The burden is light. There's responsibility there. But it does not weary one as the heaviness of sin does. This lesson handout. There's one who has come. And he is greater than John. And John introduced him in John 1.29 as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And here is this wonderful invitation at the end of Matthew chapter 11. That will conclude our study tonight. I heard a buzzer and we have four minutes on the clock, but we're not even going to really have time to get out our next handout, but I'll have that for you the next time I teach, which will be a while. I have some vacation days coming up, so it'll be after that. But it will be in Matthew chapter 12, and this is going to be four confrontations with the Jews, a variety of settings there, and it's going to include that one passage that people will often ask a question about. What about the unforgivable sin? It talks about that in Matthew chapter 12. They accuse Jesus of doing things by the power of Beelzebul. And Jesus talks about 
you can blaspheme the Son of Man and be forgiven. But if you do it to the Holy Spirit, you won't be forgiven. And people wonder about the unforgivable sin. What is that? Is it, a, is it a word that I say? Is it something I do? And if I've, if I've done it, if I've committed this error, can I ever be forgiven? Is there any hope for me? People ask that question in this text. And so this is a chapter where we'll talk about that. Any final comments? We're dismissed. Thank you.